Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves, featuring conversations with special guests on topics related, but not limited to burnout, mindset, fulfillment, transitions, wellness, and so much more. I am your host, Jessica Locke, Astrala Yoga Guide and Holistic Wellness Coach. And this podcast is not about telling you what to do. I believe we all have the answers we need within. This podcast is here to inspire you, help you find clarity, and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. And of course, we'll be sharing tools and strategies from our guests to embrace your inner wisdom and live unleashed. Ready to dive in? When was the last time you've given yourself space to explore? With no expectations, just curiosity and discovery. Most of my biggest lessons and learnings happen when I least expected it. When I allow myself to play. We're curious creatures. We like to create, build, and grow. But we've been so constricted by results and goals that we skip playtime and dive right into achieving. Removing the spirit of exploration and losing that sense of wonder. My guest today, Kat Harrow, talks about how her experiences didn't make a lot of sense on paper at first, but ultimately gave her so much clarity in finding what worked for her and what her zone of genius is. Cad is a COO and integrator for seven-figure visionary female entrepreneurs. She supports the entire inner workings of their business by supporting team hiring and management, systems, automations, and operations. She has managed six and seven figure online course launches and loves helping visionaries step into their full zone of genius. She's also the co-founder of TTC Society, a community and podcast to support those who identify as women and are going through a fertility journey. When she's not working, she loves to spend time outdoors with her little family and French bulldog. In today's episode, Kat shares... The moment she realized the career she studied and invested in wasn't for her, how it felt to walk away from the path and let go of that identity, the lessons she learned from allowing herself to explore and try new things, the importance of boundaries and how motherhood helped her stop overextending herself, how she manages multi-million dollar businesses and their teams with ease, how to ask the right questions to get the answers you need, and what she hopes to accomplish and achieve through TTC Society, and so many more great nuggets of wisdom. I probably highlighted the entire episode. So grab a warm beverage, some snacks if you want, get cozy, and join our conversation. Welcome, Kat. I am so honored to have you here today. And I've told you this since we first met a couple months ago uh, when I joined Melissa Griffin's Mastermind, Aligned Abundance Mastermind, that you make dreams come true. So Kat is one of the coaches there. And the way she sees every problem or difficulty that we have will make you feel inspired because she doesn't see a problem. She sees an opportunity. So I'm excited to have you here. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? Well, thanks. First and foremost, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, So yeah, like as you said, we met at Melissa Griffin's Aligned Abundance Mastermind, and I am a systems and operations coach. So I support online entrepreneurs to essentially build their teams, create systems, and kind of all the um, non-glamorous behind the scenes things, but that really make a difference in a business being scalable and functioning properly. Um, So yeah, and I I'm a, I'm a visionary for female entrepreneurs and I help them essentially run and scale their businesses. And just in my personal life, I live in Des Moines, Iowa with my little family and my French bulldog Moose, who is like one of the first loves of my life. <laughs> so yeah, that's just a little bit about me. Oh, that's amazing. So a lot of our listeners are either in the middle of starting their pivoting journey or just you know, coming back to themselves, exploring what they want to do. And I think a lot of that personal journey comes from trying to find what their zone of genius is. And they might not even understand what that means. Like, what are their strengths when they've spent so many years, you know, in a career? How was your journey into finding your zone of genius and kind of unleashing what you're great at? 
Mm, I'll say in one word, messy, (laughs) (laughs) but I think it's such a good question. I was thinking about this and I grew up in a household that really valued education. And there's a lot of pressure to figure out like what you're going to do, figure it out now, go to college, go to grad school, maybe get your PhD. Um, And I remember my freshman year of college. So I'm probably, you know, 18, 19 years old and just had a complete meltdown to my mom. And it was like, how am I supposed to pick what I'm going to do the rest of my life? Like, I don't even know what I'm good at. Like I went from being in high school where I had to raise my hand and ask to go to the bathroom to all of a sudden being like, figure out what you're going to do with your life. And (laughs) I just knew I was someone who liked to explore and wanted the freedom to do that. So Fast forward, I went to college for nutrition and I graduated um, and did my residency in dietetics and became a registered dietitian and I started practicing and I knew right away that I did not want to do this forever. And so imagine like, I mean, I'm sure many people can imagine this who have been through this, but it's like, imagine you spent four years, tons of money, then a year long residency. And you're like, Ooh, yeah, I don't like this. (laughs) And I felt so stifled by repetition competitive conversations and limited growth. And I just knew that I wanted to be and do something else. So I allowed myself, I had this like turning point in my career where I just allowed myself to lean into what felt good, not what made sense or what the trajectory was or what my parents wanted me to be or what my degree said I am. And I just started to lean in and I just I don't even think it's possible to find your zone of genius until you allow yourself to fail, until you allow yourself to figure out what you're not good at and just like get out there and try things. So after I left my career in nutrition, I dabbled in so many things. So I helped build a nutrition software program. I started creating online courses for physicians. And now what I do is it helped me pivot into what I do now, which is run and operate multi-million dollar businesses. So it, I never would have known in a million years in college that this is what I would be doing. And I don't think it would be possible for me to even find my zone of genius or what I like doing. Had I not just been open to experimentation and trying new things and also saying like, I'm not going to pigeonhole myself just because I, everything's saying that I should be a dietitian or I should do this. I just allowed myself to do things that made no sense to anyone, but me. And it's provided so much clarity in my life. Um, yeah, I just can't thank my younger self enough for allowing, you know, the freedom to explore that. Yeah. And having the courage, I love how you brought up, you know, you didn't know what you were doing Yeah, and allowing yourself to fail, which is so often what stops us from trying anything else at all. The Mm -hmm. fear of failure and thinking that things wouldn't work out. How, what were some of the challenges, I guess your mindset blocks that you had to work through? You mentioned, you know, not being afraid of what your parents said. I can relate to that. (laughs) I'm like, oh my gosh, what are they gonna say? They're gonna think I'm a failure. And all these, you know, stories that get put on us if we try things out and experiment. I think the biggest thing that came up for me as like one of the initial challenges as I was going through this was like an identity crisis because it's so easy like to tell someone like if you're like, I'm a lawyer, I'm a dietitian, I'm a dental hygienist, whatever it is, it's like, oh, I know what that is versus like, okay, who am I? I tied so much of who I was with what I did. And so when I was ready to leave that behind, it was like, I don't know who I am without that piece of me. And so I think there was almost that, which was also, as we talked about, not a problem, but an opportunity to understand that there's so much to you besides what you do for a living or what you went to college for, or just any piece of your life. Like we're very multidimensional humans and there's so many, so much intersectionality of all of our identities. Um, so that was an initial challenge that I faced. And I think all of the challenges, to be honest, were just things that were rooted in my own resistance, like what it meant to have a college degree, what it meant to have a certain title. And as soon as I left that behind and just like leaned into what felt good. It's like the money followed what was possible for me followed and fulfillment followed. But I just had to like lean into like, why am I actually resisting this thing that I know is going to feel good or give me clarity if it's for me or not for me? Yeah. 
I love how also I appreciate your honesty about your career journey because so often we think if I take this role, then these are the results. But like yeah. you shared, there was it's kind of like all over the place that led you here. Like what you started with wasn't necessarily what it helped you, but it wasn't where you ended up. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Totally. And I think people like, I know there's like the phrase that goes around like multi-passionate and allow yourself to be multi-passionate and to feel into different things and have many different lifetimes. And it sometimes the trajectory and on paper, it doesn't make sense, but in your head, maybe you learned something like, let's say you were a dance instructor. Maybe you learned something from that experience that helped you realize that you're a phenomenal business person or that you are super nurturing and you want to be a parent or whatever that is. Like it, there's pieces of any experience that help propel you into the next opportunity that's out there. Yes. Yes. I can totally relate. There were so many directions I took that didn't make any sense, but yeah. it led me exactly where I'm meant to be right now. Mm, and it's so beautiful that. to be able to see that. Yes, it is. And it's just, and you just have to allow yourself to say, it doesn't make sense to anyone but me. And that's all that matters. It's all that matters is that it makes sense to me. Yeah. And cultivating that inner trust. Mm, yeah. Did it become stronger as you started to just listen and followed it? Yeah, that's so true. It's it's like one of those non-tangible things that I don't even think I was giving myself or realized because I don't think I trusted myself for a long time. And I think all those experiences allowed me to have that. Um, yeah, it's, it's there's so many like non-tangible things that you're like, oh, that provided this perspective or this this unique thing in my life. Yeah. Mm. So how do you tap into your zone of genius? through being the COO of Melissa's company and an integrator and all the other projects that you're going. Yeah. For me, my zone of genius is all about team. And I think that I'm really good at hiring people and removing barriers and seeing them as the humans and, and the talent that each of them has to create a really productive environment where people enjoy coming to work every day and are like moving towards a common goal. Um, so a lot of people who are in an integrated role are very insanely organized, which is like also an amazing trait to have because you're managing so many processes and projects. And I'm definitely organized, but I've realized and even in comparison to other integrators, I know that my zone of genius is like the people management and understanding that like great businesses are built on great teams and helping to find those unique pieces of people that is, is their zone of genius and then giving them opportunities to sit in that. So I think that that's really what mine is all about. Right. Yeah. I can definitely see that too. You're, you're interested in people and not just what they provide for you, but also the connections and just making them feel good. It, it's the foundation for any working business and company, right? Totally. And if we spend like, if you, I mean, if you work like quote unquote normal hours, like eight hours a day mm-hmm. with people. And if you don't have that intimacy and connection And understanding that you're working towards this common goal, it can feel really empty, especially on a remote team. So Mm -hmm. that's just something that I've really honed in is like culture of what we're creating together and just hiring really good, smart people to help move us forward. I love this because it also leads to the next question. Like, how do you set proper boundaries? As someone who, you know, cares about people, that's one of my fears, actually. Like, will I be able to set proper boundaries if I hire people? Will I be, like, overbearing? Will I be responding all the time? Yeah. Honestly, I feel like it took me a while to establish clear boundaries, especially because, like, I will say... I was someone who would like log into Slack. Like I'd wake up in the middle of the night and be like, I'll just check Slack quick or (laughs) all these things. And it took me a while, but honestly, I think one of the best turning points, and not that everyone has to do this because this is a dramatic turning point for learning how to create a boundary. But one of the best things for me was becoming a mom because my time became so limited. And so for me to like set and hold boundaries, it meant I was saying no to time with my family or my my daughter. And 
that just changed everything for me. And I think I honestly, I became 10 times better at my job. When I became a mom, I was so much better at my boundaries because I understood what I was giving up when I did log into Slack or did do these things. Um, and then I also realized that if I didn't have clear boundaries as like a leader of a company, then what am I, uh, embodying for everyone else? Because a team culture and everything starts with at the top. So if, if you have no boundaries as the CEO or COO or whatever your role is at the top, then no one who works for you is going to have boundaries or they're going to see that and, and think that's the culture of this company. And I do have boundaries. So I know I don't fit in with this culture. So that was a huge turning point for me too, is like realizing like it, it starts here. So if I want my team to have beautiful, full lives and be productive and happy where they work, then I have to have boundaries so they can also have boundaries. That is so true. And it's, it's an interesting divergence because I, it's not the first time I've heard where people, mothers say, once I became a mother, I was so much more better at my time. And there's like a preconceived notion that you can do either or it's either you work or you're full-time mom, but you can balance it all. You just have to work smart. Yes, definitely. And, and it's funny too, because I think, I mean, that's just probably patriarchal society is like, well, yeah. I'm a mom, then, uh, you know, you have to make all these, you have to choose, or you'll only be good at one of the things. And then I think you can see this, like, diversion where, or, you know, collision where they actually really complement each other. And because when you're like a mom, you're a leader, right? You're like leading this little person, you're being tested all the time and figuring out more about yourself. And it's the same with running the company. And so I think that there's more commonalities than not. And Mm -hmm. it does help provide that like real tight, um, framework of like, you have this amount of time, (laughs) how are you going to use it? And it really, Really changed everything for me. Wow. What were some things that you've learned in that process? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, definitely the, the biggest thing is like that it starts with me, just like a, a little baby is going to embody how their parents show up and how they talk about themselves and how they do that. Like your team is too. And so I'm not saying that, you know, your team are children, but yeah. again, like it's, it starts with who you're being at the top of the company. And so that's something I really learned. Um, and also just to like respect my time more. I think that I'm someone who I'm an Enneagram too. So I love to help people like anyone, anyone in crisis. I'm like, I'm coming. And often it would be at the sacrifice of my, myself, my own desires, my, um, sleep schedule, whatever that was. Like I would cross those boundaries all the time because I had the identity of, I am the helper. Mm -hmm. And then I realized like my, ability to help is actually being hurt because I'm not taking care of myself and I'm not establishing those boundaries. So again, like kind of having an identity shift there of like, Mm -hmm. how can I be the best helper? Well, no, it's not like doing this in the middle of the night or staying up till then it's, you know, figuring this out in a better time timeline so that it's better for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing I've also learned from, you know, constantly always being the helper is that as much as we want to help that person, we can't solve anything for them. We can't, you know, walk the walk for yes. them. <laughs> oh, I love that too. It's so true. Like you have to completely uh, detach that you're responsible for someone else. And to be honest, I still have to practice this and tell myself this on a daily basis. Like I'm yeah. not responsible for them. Like I provided this and yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a learning lesson. It's so funny. Cause I think most people's the best thing about them, you know, usually that like their special unique thing is the best thing. And then it can also be the worst thing <laughs> because it usually is like people probably love just that you're a helper and you probably show up for people in really big ways. But then it's probably also something that if you dive into it too much, it drains yourself, you feel resentful or whatever it is. So it's like that balance. Yes. yes I love that you brought it up because it, it was it is my strength and also my Achilles heel. Yeah. <laughs> At my old career, you know, back in advertising, I was like, I'll fix it. Oh, I'll work overnight. Oh, I'll do it. And then I was like, well, I'm just bitter and tired yes. and nobody is really appreciating me because they assume I can do it all the time. <laughs> and now they're giving me more work. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm just smiling and like taking it. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, 
Another question, a bit more technical. You're someone who oversees the inners and outings of a company, and you kind of know every moving part. How do you and Exchange get the support that you need when you're、mm. supporting everyone else? Yeah, that's a good question. I. I will say again, it this really hasn't always been easy for me <laughs> as it too <laughs> to fill up my own cup. But I think the biggest thing for me is just to like touch base with myself of what I need and not be afraid to ask for it. And one of the most powerful things that I learned is that no one is a mind reader, not even the people who love you the most, who you spend the most time with. Like if you have a partner or a parent or best friend, whoever that is in your life.、Mm-hmm. Um, They still don't know the inner workings of your minds and your needs, and so it's really important to get the support that you need by sharing and communicating that. And I just feel like in any relationship, including the relationship with yourself, like mastering the art and constantly working on your communication, and also that like touching base with yourself, like having those internal conversations of like, how do I actually feel about this, or What is draining me right now, and being open to that is really, really powerful. So, definitely, you know, personal communication and then communication with others, and again, just like realizing no one's a mind reader, so you have to do that work for other people. And just like I would want someone to tell me what their needs are and how they can feel supported, because I only know how to support myself, and it might be totally different than how someone else wants to feel supported. This could be the title of this episode. Nobody is a mind reader. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> I have、so、to tell myself、true. that all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to do that too as well. Constantly, like, just don't assume. I think sometimes we assume things, and that's where it gets、yeah. blurry and the gray zone. We fall into that. Yeah,、mm-hmm. and that's why I love the, like the love languages because I think it's so unique to you know how you like to receive love. Um, and so you might just assume that someone else in your life they also want to receive love that way, and it could be totally different. So, I think you know it's like understanding those th- little nuances that make us all special and unique.、Uh, just like can really make meaningful change and can make people feel really supported. Yeah, definitely. Are you ready to create space for ease and alignment? I've created a free starter guide to help you go from frazzled to focus. It's a guide for the overwhelmed go-getter who's eager to find more ease, clarity, and alignment in their lives, so you can quiet the noise and strengthen your connection within. After all, we can't align what we don't know is misaligned. Simply grab your free copy at wholeandunleashed.com/guide. I wanted to also talk about、um, an, another project of you that you recently started, which is a podcast with your friend Jasmine Shea, TTC,、uh, trying to conceive society.、Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that and why you started? Yeah, I love that you brought this up because this is just something that's been really near and dear to my heart. And、um, my friend Jasmine and I have been friends for a long time, and we both went through our unique fertility journeys. To get to where we are today, and it's something that is is not talked about enough. Like even though it's becoming a little more mainstream, and there's you know Instagram accounts, and you can start like understanding more, it's still really、um, not talked about enough. Especially that it affects one in eight people. And so when you're going through the depths of fertility treatments, or even just like a trying to conceive journey before you escalate it to get getting medical intervention, it just feels Feels like you're one in a million, and it feels so lonely. And so we launched a podcast and a community to have these conversations, to share real women and men's stories, to provide hope and where there's opportunities for growth in this, and also just to hold space for this really dark time in people's lives. So yeah, we're so proud of it. We launched it in November, and it's just been incredible to hear so many people who've reached out and shared that it's made them feel not. Alone in this journey, and it's helped provide, you know, really supportive、um, help when when they're in this. Yeah, like thank you for creating such an important, vulnerable platform. Like you said, we all go through similar experiences, or people who are trying to conceive, but it doesn't go beyond. It has to go. 
further than just sharing it? What are the support? How can you create that safe space where you can kind of process? Because it's pretty scary and traumatic to, you know, have to go through that and all the misconceptions that are also attached to it too. Yes, yeah, so many misconceptions and just so many things like we were talking about boundaries earlier. Like that's even something we talk about on the podcast is how to establish boundaries of what you are willing to talk about and not talk about and Mm -hmm. how to go through all these things that you have not ever thought you had to deal with until you're in the midst of a journey like this. Wow. What are some, some ways that you know, you have resources, what are some ways that people can tell their families about it if they choose to? Yeah, I think, you know, again, it's if you choose to and and who you want to share with is that's a, like a sacred relationship because you either want that support from them or it's important for them to know what's going on in your life. Um, but I think that just just sharing openly what you're going through. And I think Uh, also maybe even setting the stage that you don't want advice. Like sometimes, you know, when you just want to share that you're having a hard day, or maybe you had like a loss of deep loss in your life. Like no one is going to change the fact that that loss happened, but what they can do is sit with you and hold space for you. And so even if you're like, for example, let's say your mom is a fixer and if you tell her she's going to spin it to try to fix it or, you know, potentially give quote unquote toxic positivity, um, maybe just even when you open up saying, you know, I'm going to tell you something of what I'm going through and I, I don't want any advice. I don't, you know, don't need any more questions, but I just, I just need you to sit with me. I need you to be with me on this journey. And I, it's important for me, for you to know, because I love you. And I think just establishing that right off the bat, it's going to like create so much less friction for you. If that's something that maybe you are worried about. Thank you for sharing that. Because I think oftentimes when we feel like we want to talk to someone, we don't necessarily know what do we want. So that also puts you in a position where you're like, what am I, you know, I want support, but how can I be more clear about the support that I want. Yes, totally. And I, so we have in our, in our mastermind, we have a channel in Slack that's called hold space for me. And I've noticed that too, like sometimes people want advice, like how do I, you know, deal with this? And sometimes they just want to be loved up on and like, um, someone to say me too, or someone to say, like, I love you. You're so brave or whatever that is, that's what they actually need and want out of that. And so I think defining that for, for people, like, again, no one's a mind reader, (laughs) Um, defining that for people is really, really powerful. In addition to that, what are some, I guess, do's or don'ts for somebody who wants to support someone they know, know through a fertility journey? Yeah. Don't ever give unsolicited advice. I think this is true. It's like, it's true of so many things in life, whether it's, you know, of starting a business or parenting or, becoming a marathon runner, whatever it is, just don't give unsolicited advice unless they're specifically asking for you. So if someone, you know, has approached you and said, you know, I'm going through fertility treatments or I'm having trouble conceiving, it's bringing a lot of anxiety in my life or whatever that is, they feel safe with you. And that's step one. And so chances are if they're on this journey, they have Googled everything. They have tried everything. (laughs) They have explored everything. So it's like, um, you know, you telling someone like, have you tried this diet? Like that's not going to make them feel better. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Have you tried going vegan? Have you tried getting rid of all your plastics? Have you done this? Mm -hmm. Um, they probably tried it all because the information, there's no uh, shortage of information out there right now. So the reason they're telling you is because they want someone to sit with them. They want someone to validate their emotions and something that you can do just being a friend or someone who is with someone on this journey is also just celebrating their small milestones. Um, I think, gosh, this is, this is true with so many things. I love how this can relate to just many different things, but with the fertility journey, oh my gosh, it's like you get through this test, you try this treatment, you do this. And it's like, 
so many different things that should be celebrated because it's all leading to hopefully your goal of expanding your family. And I mean, I think the same with business, like, like let's celebrate that you did this thing versus Mm -hmm. like, oh, we'll celebrate when you hit a million (laughs) dollars. And so I think that's something that has been really powerful for me is having people who do celebrate those milestones. Like, oh, you had this test today. Like, how are you? I'm so happy that's over. Like, on to the next thing. Like, this is amazing. And, and that really helped me keep going is to like recognize all these like little micro moments that are leading up to my ultimate goal, which was to expand our family. Yeah, that's beautiful. And again, it makes us be responsible for what we want and also be aware of the boundaries when we're talking to other people, because it can be so sensitive, even just asking a married couple, like, Hey, when are the kids coming? Can be, you know, oh, it can yeah. a lot of uncomfortable and like scary situations that they're, they're not ready to share either. Yeah. And, and that's huge too. And something I learned, cause I was very guilty of this. Like Me when do you have another baby, do you want more kids? And, um, like, so we went through secondary infertility, so we got pregnant easy peasy with our first, and then it took years and, uh, fertility treatments with our second. And so for us, like people would often ask like, when are you going to give her a sibling or when do you want to do this? And every time it was just like a dagger to the heart. Cause it was like, well, we're trying and I'm spending thousands of dollars and you know, everything. And so that has created so much, um, just awareness for me of, of so many other people's situations, whether, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever it is of being conscious of what you're asking someone and realizing that maybe the reason they haven't shared that is because it's personal or hurtful or just not something that they want to share with you specifically. What are some ways that you seek for additional support? Because, you know, it's a pretty intense experience and, Yeah. Yeah. For me, starting this podcast was like an amazing supportive thing. It was like verbally processing what we were going through. Like when we started um, for both Jasmine and I, when we started the podcast, we were both in the midst of our fertility treatments and both of us are pregnant now, which we're really excited about. But um, yeah, so it was, that was really helpful in finding community. And also uh, we went both Jasmine and I go to therapy. And that's been so helpful because there is, um, there is trauma with an experience like this. And I think just validating that that's part of this was really helpful for me to, to learn, you know, good coping mechanisms and to just validate my emotions and know that it's okay to feel certain things and, or things creep back in. So those are some ways that I have found support. Thank you for sharing, especially the validating part, because sometimes we know, like our brain knows that, you know, oh, we can try again and all those other things. Yeah. But it helps to help someone to hold that space for you. Like when I first started to go to therapy, in my mind, it's like, I can process things. I got this. Yeah. And then I realized just having someone be there, it's not like they're changing my life, but just being there and holding that sacred space is so healing. Totally. And, and just to like ask questions instead of give answers, because like we've talked about, it's like, we have the answers within us. Sometimes you just need someone to help extract your inner wisdom. And that is something that therapy has really mirrored for me and been really powerful. Mm. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited because again, one of the questions I have for you is because I've noticed that whenever somebody, at least in the mastermind, they need help with something, you always ask like the best questions like you're not telling them what to do you're just like kind of like how about you look at it from this angle (laughs) how do you do that (laughs) honestly I I was not always that way I was a a, an advice giver always unsolicited advice giver (laughs) um but I actually went through a coaching program and that helped me a lot because it helped me realize that the quality of my life is determined by the quality of questions that we ask and so it it just the more specific that you are in understanding what someone's actually asking you, the better advice you can get. So when, you know, when you can ask more specific questions, you're going to get better answers and you're going to get what you actually want. So even for example, like in the business world, if someone said like, Hey, Jess, can you look at this page and tell me what you think? Well, that's like a really like wide thing. Like 
do you want me to look at the graphics? Do you want me to look at the words on the page? Do you want me to look at it from a perspective of how it will convert? Um, and so just asking those types of questions that give clarity of what they're actually seeking can help you just give better support. And then also if you're on the opposite side of it, the, the question asker is to get what you need more. Yeah. I, like having, being the the question asker and I used to add broad questions like this before. I'm like, just yeah. help me. I don't know what to do. Take a look. And then you would ask questions like, Oh, what are you trying to accomplish here? Like, I'm like, Oh yeah. And that's, it's kind of like internal coaching for myself. <laughs> yeah. Like what's the intention behind the question? Cause sometimes someone might ask you something like, Hey, Jess, do you like the city of Toronto? <laughs> and it's like, you know, we were just talking about Toronto cause she lives there. And then you could ask like, you know, what's the intention behind this question? Cause maybe I'm asking, cause I want to move there or I want to send my kids to school there or my mom's moving there. Uh, whatever that is. So like they're very different intentions behind that simple question. So you can get really what you're looking for by asking better questions. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. I'm ex I hope <laughs> people, you know, start following and practice. It, it's also a practice. I think there's opportunities oh, yeah. where <laughs> it gets better and better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to flex that muscle. <laughs> yeah. And you have like so many things going on. What are some other ways I know you talk about connecting to yourself? What are some actual tools you use to stay grounded and make sure that you don't spiral in all the things you get to do? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so true. I have recognized things that drain me and recognize things that really fill me up. So even just like little things like every, well, actually this is a big thing, but just like learning to, we, we work from home, learning to log off at a certain time was really powerful for me. Like, I think everyone now, even if you like have a quote unquote normal job, like you're probably working from home right now. And, and all of a sudden you realize there's this boundary of like, oh, I'll just log in. I'll just do this thing really quick. Um, so that's been a huge thing for me. And also I know I'm someone who I feel rejuvenated when I'm in nature. Like that's something that always fills me up. So try to go for a daily walk. My family goes for hikes every weekend. Like we all go together and with our dog. And I think just like recognizing like your feelings, it's something you're not taught in school. It's so basic of like, how are you feeling? Oh, is this thing making you feel exhausted? Is this thing bringing you joy? Like we don't talk about that. And when you're in elementary school, I think hopefully they are now, um, but they didn't when I was there. And so it's like recognizing those things and then realizing like what, what you actually need to feel full and what you need to feel rejuvenated and, and tapping into those things. Yeah. I, the feelings I can totally relate. I was like, something's uncomfortable, push it down. Something feels weird. And yeah. judging those feelings, like letting it come up mm, and responding yes. it to a way that it's not like, oh, I should be working like five more hours, but you know what? I'm pulled to take a bubble bath and it sounds ridiculous, but when you allow yourself to feel good, you kind of just kind of recalibrate your brain. You feel more refreshed and inspired afterwards. Yeah. And I grew up in a house that was like, had maybe toxic positivity is what you could name it. But like, um, I'm from the Midwest. So people like, don't, don't, they're always like very friendly, like don't talk about their bad days. And that was ingrained in me for a very long time. And so it, it was like a detriment because then I didn't want to actually, like you were saying, deal with a uh, quote unquote negative emotion or experience. And so I would just bury it and move on until those things like cascade and build. And so, uh, yeah. it's really powerful. Like even just talking about it and, and being open to exploring what those feelings are and what they're, what they're trying to tell you, because if you're experiencing something, um, it's probably trying to tell you something like maybe it's that you need to slow down, or maybe it's that you need to rest. Or if you have your body saying, I need a bubble bath at two, there's probably a reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just honor it. Just honor it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what are some common blocks you see? You work with a lot of new business owners. Uh -huh. What are some common blocks you've noticed when they first get started or when they join a mastermind or whatever they're trying to do? Mm, there's so many. And so again, like I specifically work in coaching with systems operation and team building. So one of the biggest blocks that I'll see is people thinking they're not ready to hire a team. Um, people like essentially, uh, 
inhibiting their growth because they don't want to let go and they don't want to give up something because this is their quote unquote baby. And, um, those are things I love working through because it's like when you remove the fact, especially with the brands that we work with, they're personal brands. So it's like you're behind it, but when you help them realize that it's something outside of them too, it's easier to let go. It's easier to bring in people for support. It's easier to live the life that you want when you have people who are helping you with that. So I love to kind of like go through those uh, misconceptions of what it means to hire a team and help people get the support that they need so that they can actually live out there. These really big missions and goals that they have in their life. And I just don't feel that you can do that alone. So it's really powerful when you can call in people who are on the same page with you and want to help you grow your business. Yeah, a hundred percent. I've learned that from you so much just from thinking I have to do it all or that things have to be this way. And then seeing that, no, I can let my business grow. It's an extension of me, but it's not me. And it feels like it's me, but it's not. Right. Totally. That's huge. That's so huge. I know we were talking about this earlier too, but it's like, if you were to launch a product and let's say someone didn't like it and then you say, well, they don't like me. That's like a really big distinction, right? Of like, oh no, you just like, maybe this page like had a tech glitch or the copy needed to be changed versus like me as a person, like, wow, that's a big distinction, but we see it a lot, especially in this industry where people kind of internalize what's happening with something that it means something about themselves when it doesn't. So that's something I love to work on. Cause I think it creates longevity, uh, you know, um, it helps you just like step into who you are and then call in the support that you need to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and I think especially for industry where people are starting their own business because they want to help, they yeah. have that. So they think, you know, I'm going to sacrifice myself. I'm going to give everything for free. So thank you for bringing such an important point. Yeah that we can (laughs) yeah Yeah. oh Oh my gosh thank you so much for all your wisdom that you've shared today I wanted to close this with some rapid fire questions cool are you ready (laughs) yeah let's do it (laughs) what's the best compliment you've ever received a colleague of mine once told me how powerful I was and I will never forget that because I had never thought of myself in that way and so it's still one of the best compliments Mm -hmm. A book does change your life. Mm, the four agreements. Ooh, it's the second time that somebody in the podcast changed it. So oh, I definitely really? have to have read, you read it. it? <laughs> Not yet. It's in my list. Like my to read list is it's, growing every day. It's really little. It's like an easy, quick read. You could read it in a few hours. Ooh, okay, that might be my next read now. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, it's not a like Harry Potter series. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> what does coming home mean to you? Mm, coming home means to me leaning into what feels good and, and listening to those pings when something feels right and following it. What do you want more of? I always want more time. I'm I've, that's the only resource I know that's not renewable. And I just always want more of it. (laughs) Yeah, me too. (laughs) Any advice for a younger self? I think I would tell my younger self that you can write your own resume. You don't have to wait for someone to take a chance on you. You can create whatever future you want and create those experiences for yourself. And you can create your own resume without someone saying that you're worthy of this experience or this job title or whatever it is. And where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram. Uh, my personal one is Kat Harrow, so K A T H E R R O. Or if you are going through a trying to conceive journey, come join us on TTC Society on Instagram. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kat. Thanks for having me. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Whole and Unleashed podcast. What was your takeaway from today's conversation? Let me know in the comments or review. I would love to hear from you. Subscribe to get new episodes each week and visit wholeandunleashed.com for more information.